Hi everyone, welcome um, to the Black Arts Grant Program Town Hall. My name is Tamaj Garad. I'm the Outreach and Access Program Manager at TAC. My role at TAC is to support outreach activities across all of our different programs, and I'm also leading the development of this program, the Black Arts Program that we're going to be talking about today. So I'm really excited to present this program to you. The purpose of today is really just to share what we've been working on um, with regards to the program, how it's been developing, and also to give you an opportunity to ask any questions and um, to share any feedback that you might have after this presentation. So keep in mind that the program is still being finalized, so there is an opportunity here to, to share your input as well. So before we start, I just want to acknowledge some of the accessibility features here. So um, ASL interpretation is available to the right of the screen for the duration of the session. Um, to turn on closed captioning, you can look at the bottom of your screen to, to the right, um, and there's an icon there, it says CC, live transcription, and you can turn on closed captioning that way. You can also enlarge the screen by moving the split screen bar in the middle, and a chat box is available to you if you have comments. Um, there's also a Q&A box if you have a question. And for the first 30 minutes or so, I'm actually going to be just sharing the presentation and we won't be having a discussion at that point. But after the 30 minute point, we'll open up um, the floor to just discussion and answering questions and, and feedback. So um, I would ask you to just hold on to your questions or just share them and then wait until the end of the presentation to have the questions answered. Um, and I'll also be sharing any feedback that you decide to share. So this video is also, this session is also being recorded and we will be sharing this to um, our social media, on YouTube, and anyone who missed the session and wanted to, to join. Um, it's being recorded for the benefit of those who were not able to join us today. Um, so just to be mindful, uh, you won't be visible on camera, but you will have an opportunity to um, be audible if you choose to speak. You can also just have a conversation or ask your questions in, in the comments as well, if that's something that's that's more comfortable to you. So kind of different options um, that you'll have available to engage. So before we start talking about the program and I share what the program will look like, I do wanna acknowledge the land that we're on. As we gather today, we wanna to acknowledge the diversity of the first peoples of this area and recognize the territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. Today, Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island and around the world, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, to live, and to meet on this territory. So the Black Arts Program, as some of you already know, um, is a new program that we're launching at TAC. It's a funding opportunity to support the Black Arts community, which would include individual artists, collectives, and organizations. Um, and this program is really in response to the systemic barriers that Black artists um, may be facing in funding and seeking funding. And the program also seeks to address some of those disparities um, that come from those barriers and hopefully provide sustainable supports to Toronto Black artists and arts organizations. So we also engaged in a lot of community consultations to develop this program. So we really wanted this program to be community driven, to hear from Black artists and arts workers about what their needs are, what their, um, what their ideas are, and just what they envision for this program as a whole. So what we did was in developing this program, we were able to consult with over 300 Black artists and arts workers across various disciplines and experience levels through different touch points, through surveys and focus groups. And what ended up happening is we had two different phases of these consultation sessions. One that happened last year where we kind of just discussed what the community would need. So it was kind of just a, a getting an idea of what different artists, the challenges that they're facing and what they may need. Um, and that process were 
a series of recommendations came out of that process. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is a report that was developed from those consultations. And it says Black Arts Funding for a Black Arts Future, recommendations for Toronto Arts Council. So what ended up happening is we assessed some of these conversations that we were having, and we pulled out some of the key recommendations and that really informed the program design that I'm gonna share with you today. Some things that artists and arts workers mentioned in these conversations were really encouraging us to think deeply about long-term supports and sustainability for black artists through this program. Some other structural changes were suggested as well, like more accessibility with the application process, um, simplifying um, application questions, including a rolling deadline, and also making sure that we are um, engaging a little bit deeper with the Black community um, in terms of outreach, making sure that we are coming out to where Black art is happening, um, supporting Black artists and Black-led organizations to build bridges amongst each other as well. So in general, um, Black artists and arts workers that participated in these consultations felt that some of the key areas of support were professional development opportunities, artistic mentorship, and marketing and audience development. And anywhere between 70 to 85% of um, folks that we spoke to felt this way. So those were some areas that we focused on when it came to developing the design. So that brings me to phase two of this consultation process. So last year we had that um, assessment of needs. And then this year we had a conversation again with black artists and arts workers. Once we had implemented some of those previous recommendations, created a design, and we wanted to really have a conversation about this initial design. We wanted to ask black artists and arts workers how they felt about it, if there were ways that they envision it being implemented, what suggestions they might have for the guidelines as we are developing guidelines and application process. And they, there was a number of different suggestions that came up. And so most of this presentation, I'm going to be sharing what Black artists and arts workers said about the, the design of the program. The design of the program is really the different components uh, of what we will fund who is eligible for the funding, and what this program will look like as a whole. So I'm gonna be sharing that as well. And there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions and also provide any feedback or input that you might have. So generally speaking, the program design will be available um, to artists and arts workers or arts organizations of various disciplines. It'll consist of two main program streams, annual operating and project, and the total budget for both would be 500,000 um, for 2021. So Black Arts Projects, I'm gonna talk about this first, and there are a couple of different components within Black Arts Projects. So we'll go over the different components, what they fund or what we're, we're hoping to fund through these components and um, different ways that you can potentially use this funding as well. So before I get into what this, this funding will look like, um, I wanna talk a little bit about where it came from. So again, going back to that co-design process with um, Black arts community members, project funding priorities uh, were something that we discussed a lot. And 68% of survey participants said that art creation in any discipline was the most important project funding activity. So this is something that we definitely focused on when it comes to the design. One participant in particular uh, said something that really stuck with me. Um, they said, how can, and this is just a question again to, that we thought about is, how can TAC help lift up artists who need help getting their work out into space, in a theater, on a screen, to alleviate some pressure and allow for freer creation? So the idea of freer creation, having a program that is flexible to the, the changing and varying needs of Black artists was definitely an emphasis in the conversations that we were having. So Black artists across disciplines agreed that 
audience development and public presentation support was definitely essential in particular to support artists long-term to sustain their art practices. So the first component I'm gonna share under the project stream is creation and development. So this will have a rolling deadline. Rolling deadline means that applicants can apply at various points of the year and throughout the year. So this would support full creation, partial creation, or completion of a work in progress of an arts-based project at any stage and in any arts discipline. So creation and development would be open to individual artists and artist collectives. An artist collective is defined in this case as two or more artists. Maximum grant is 10,000. And then we also are looking at adding a mentorship component to this particular component. So the mentorship component would be a separate type of application, but, but would be integrated into the creation and development. So those who are looking for one-to-one -one mentorship um, can write the application for mentorship as well. They can add that to their application and they would be eligible for a maximum of 15,000. So 5,000 um, additional for a mentorship component. So some of the changes um, that happened to the initial design, I want to talk a little bit about the evolution because it was definitely, uh, there was definitely a change that happened from our initial design to this design that you're seeing. And that was because of the conversations we had with that co-design process. So participants in the initial design, they looked at and said that they desired a, a bit of a simpler version of the design. Originally, we had proposed for professional development to be a separate component. Um, and that would have included things like research and development, leadership development, and arts-based skill development. However, most of the participants, about 68%, believe that research and development was the most important component of professional development and should be focused on. So instead of having various different components and, and complicating um, this project stream, we decided to actually just open up creation to include development. So now artists can also apply to research and development a stage of their project, which means that you don't necessarily need to create a full arts-based project if you are in a place where you're looking at just, you have an idea and you want to explore it. This project component would give you the opportunity for that more exploratory phase of your um, creation. So that's something that has um, been adapted since the co-design. So another component of project is pr uh, presentation, which will also have a rolling deadline. So this would support exhibition, um, presentation and dissemination of work by Black artists in any arts discipline. This is open to individual artists, artist collectives, and arts organizations with existing work to share. So you would have to have something that you would like to present to the community or, or share um, to be able to be eligible for this component. It does not fund creation. Maximum grant for this is 15,000. And it also has a built-in mentorship component that you can apply to as an option. And that would make you eligible for up to uh, 20,000. So presentation, some of the expenses can include things like, um, you know, uh, fees and costs, administrative fees and costs, including installation, um, rehearsal, venue, production, et cetera, uh, dissemination costs, publicity, marketing, outreach, and of course, fees paid to artists, collaborators, and mentors. So there was, a couple of things that um, we were thinking about in terms of the idea of sustainability. So a big part of the conversation we had um, with Black artists was the need to provide avenues for sustainable art practice to support artists long time with um, their overall development, um, professional development, and also to create opportunities for people to be able to meet and collaborate. And this came out of a conversation around barriers that exist for Black artists currently in the city to be able to do that um, 
you know, at the same at the same level and and some of the historic disadvantages to be able to access some of these supports as well. So instead of providing a program where we're simply funding a creation project or we're simply funding um, presentation, we're looking at these other additional supports that will also support black artists to be successful um, in their in their project, but also long term um, to be able to develop as as artists as well. So mentorship I already talked about, and that's sort of built into the different options that you'll see in your application. But then there's a, a, this other um, component that we're thinking of including where we are looking at creating um, access to a co-creation lab. We're calling it Black Future Studio. And Black Future Studio would be uh, a place where Black artists uh, and arts workers can collaborate, meet, and exchange ideas. And this, this is a space where it would be open to multidisciplinary artists, um, to artists of various disciplines. And it is primarily there, the objective is really to help people network, to help people get support within uh, the communities that they belong to, and also in response to some conversations that came up about um, Black artists kind of working in silos and, and the need to, to bridge some of the gaps that exist. Um, so, so this would be available for 2022 applicants is what we are um, projecting. It's still sort of in development, so it's, it won't be available for um, applicants for this year. Another support we're looking at is arts career development workshops. Again, still looking at how to how to pro provide these, but uh, the idea is drop in workshops focused on growing and establishing art practice. So these additional supports we had had we had pitched them in our initial design, um, and then of course we asked for feedback in that co design process and. This I'm showing you so that you, you know where the need is for this. Uh, an overwhelming amount of Black artists and arts workers ranked these additional supports as um, either very important or important. So 90% uh, for both mentorship and arts career development and 79% um, for networking. Uh, so this really demonstrated to us that this is something that we should should be looking at uh, implementing throughout the, the program. So I wanted to share some of the feedback and recommendations, just so you can hear what uh, some of these artists had to say. And so I'll read some of these out. One person said, many of us are hybrid artists, so funding should be a flexible container to hold our multifaceted practices. Another person said, I think it starts with mentorship, building that, that fullness of an artist who is confident, is willing to continue full-time as an artist. And in mentioning the co-creation space, uh, which we had a lot of conversations about, uh, someone said it should be fun, that's really important, it needs to have joy attached. This is part of the reason, you know, we really want to create a space um, that is something that serves the needs of, of community. So we are working on uh, taking our time with that, potentially developing some partnerships around it as well. And another person in reference to the co-creation space said that it should be a combination of resources, software, creation space, rehearsal and recording space where people can meet and have tools that they need to properly engage in these practices. So there were a lot of other comments that came out of this conversation, but I'm just sharing the few that really that really stood out, but also that really kept coming up time and time again. And this really informed our thinking about creating these supports and how to implement these supports as well. So when it comes to networking, and networking we're thinking of as is this kind of co-creation space and opportunities for artists to, to meet and, and collaborate with each other. We wanted to have an understanding of who, who should be a part of this space, included in this space, um, what were sort of the needs for um, how to create this space. So a majority of artists and arts workers um, identified the, the desire and need for networking amongst specifically Black-led organizations and Black artists. And I'm showing you this, this pie chart here because I want you to see that, you know, it was we did propose a number of different scenarios, like, for example, having 
uh, creation only space where it would just be black artists and collectives or having a space with black artists, collectives and any arts organization, whether or not they identify as black led um, and then black artists, collectives and black arts organizations. We also had lots of conversations around this. So there was definitely more of a desire to um, make sure that this is a space that anyone, whether they are a black artist or arts worker can access and that it's important to keep this as a space that is specifically um, for, for black folk. So I want to share the Black Arts Annual Operating. We've talked a lot about projects and you can definitely ask any questions that you have. At this time, if you'd like to ask questions, I encourage you to drop them in the Q&A or you can drop them in the, in the chat. You can, you, can have a, you can suggest things in the chat as well. And uh, we'll have an you'll have an opportunity to have them answered after this presentation. So annual operating will have an application deadline and that'll be fall of this year for the first deadline. Um, it's going to be supporting nonprofit Toronto Black Arts organizations and it's intended to support the development, continuation and flourishing of Black Arts organizations. In thinking about um, how to really structure and, and who, to, who to include and um, what the eligibility criteria should look like for this program, um, we asked participants of the co-design process um, who should be included in this. And we had a lot of conversations internally as well. And we came up with this program should be black led, which means that a majority of the leadership team, including, uh, you know, board members, founding members, etc., should be uh, black and black fo focused, which means that this organization should be serving the black community and primarily focused on meaningfully um, providing uh, arts based services to the black community. Um, and black serving means, again, that this organization this organization would be providing programming to black artists and supporting black artists in particular. Um, when it comes to, so we call this B3 and when it comes to B3 type organizations, um, we're not looking at, at restricting it to organizations that are only serving the black community, but that are primarily serving the black community within their mandate. So it is possible to apply if you have programming that serves you know, other communities, but um, the goal here is really for those organizations to be focused on um, serving the, the black community and um, supporting black artists in particular. So 88% of survey participants believe that operating funding for the black arts program should be accessed by um, B3 organizations. And one participant who is from a, an arts organization, um, the leader of a, of a black arts organization said, so I'm super excited about the annual operating because for us, and I think for a lot of black led organizations that are starting, it's that shift from project to project to operating that's the most difficult. This really stood out to me um, because it's that need for, for stability that I think where this, this program will really be able to support. Um, and so black artists and arts workers also express that there are some administrative barriers that have made it challenging to sustain funding over time. And so this program also seeks to reduce those barriers where possible. Some of you may know that uh, a report came out late last year called Unfunded. Um, and this report really highlighted that um, Black organizations, arts and within other, other sectors are um, severely underfunded. So uh, it's really in response to kind of those systemic barriers that create uh, challenges for Black organi arts organizations to um, continue to, to flourish and, and grow. So some thoughts on annual operating. Um, we, we asked arts workers um, who support Black arts organizations about impact because impact is really an, a key part of this conversation and why we're providing operating funding. Um, impact and sustainability in particular. So 
how could we make sure that this funding can support black organizations to develop, flourish and thrive um, long term. So a couple of thoughts here I'm going to share that came out of this conversation. Um, so someone said it would ha also help to create mentoring programs for collectives that become organizations and how um, better to function in that way because there is a lot of black led organizing that stems uh, from collectives. Um, so looking at sort of that development piece. This also informed uh, some of the supports built in for collectives within the project stream. Another person said that there should be looser parameters on funding and grant opportunities. So we are considering in the guidelines to um, make sure that the, there's a simplification of um, what we're expecting in terms of uh, parameters in terms of you know, financial statements and that kind of thing and making sure at least within the first year that it's as accessible as possible to organizations who might be just getting their start or transitioning from collectives to you know organizations um, and organizations that have had those those historic barriers to be able to um, maintain stability and within their funding which of course affects affects reporting and that kind of thing. So these are some things we're considering. And the last thing I wanna share is uh, another person shared that creating funding application guidelines that focus on equitable hiring practice um, and can help people develop opportunities. So that's basically the, the program that we are sharing today. Again, still being finalized and we're still working on developing the guidelines, um, but that's essentially what the projects program and annual operating programs look like. I wanna spend a little bit of time to talk about application structure and assessment because this is also somewhere something that we're innovating um, with this program. And I wanna share some of the changes um, that you can expect when uh, applying to this program. So I've shared that the projects will have a rolling deadline. And again, just to reiterate, a rolling deadline means that applicants can apply throughout the year. There are different points in the year where uh, applicants will be assessed. So it allows people that flexibility. And this was a, a consideration when it comes to, um, you know, uh, the pressure of deadlines that people feel, the supports that first-time applicants may need, um, and just helping people through and developing. Uh, so 93% were in favor of a rolling deadline. And there were also some considerations when it came to what it looked like to, to be assessed within this um, application. So someone said the rolling deadline is a good idea, but also increased ways that people can be assessed. And this means, you know, looking at um, providing flexibility in application format and style, um, clear guidelines, clear language with the application, um, and really just simplifying the process. Uh, a lot of conversations came up about grant writing and, and some barriers that people might be facing when it comes to grant writing. So we want to make sure to provide different options to people that perhaps they, they haven't had previously. Um, so that's where some change, you'll, see, you'll see some changes with the application structure. Application format. So this is something that we're considering that's a little bit unique um, to the TAC's granting portal. So Black artists and arts workers said that, most of them said that they would use another application format other than written if made available to them. So 43% said that they would use audio and 68% said that they would use video. Other recommendations for application accessibility include, as I mentioned, short, clear, concise questions and guidelines, building strong community partnerships to make sure that this program reaches as many people as possible, including people that are not uh, past applicants or that, that don't necessarily have a relationship with us yet as a funder. Applicant support, including grant writing, reducing some of the reporting bur burden on operating clients that I mentioned, some of the administrative um, challenges there. Um, and an option, as I just mentioned, for multiple formats, written, video, and audio. 
There were also a lot of conversations about accommodations for applicants with, with disabilities and making sure that we're improving uh, the current available in accommodations, which is also a conversation that um, is a continuous conversation we've been having at TEC. So these recommendations I wanted to share because they're the ones that really stood out from all of the conversation. This is a summary of, of what was discussed. Uh, they're not necessarily all going to be implemented, but a few of the things that I want to highlight here um, is we are looking at having a combination of multiple formats, written audio and video. Again, because of that uh, previous statistic that I shared about how people prefer to, to write their application. So of course there will be some components like where you, you're writing your demographic information, things like budgets and the declaration page that may remain written. Um, but where possible, we will be adding various different options for people um, who prefer audio, video um, or written. Okay, so that pretty much concludes uh, the presentation about the program. So this is the part of this session where you have an opportunity to share questions, um, feedback. I see that there's already a couple of questions and I'll definitely answer them. Okay. So someone is saying, uh, please speak a little on grants for individual artists, such as writers and musicians. So individual artists can apply to projects. They can apply to um, project grants, including the creation and development uh, or the presentation. So they're both open to individual artists. The only stream that's not open is uh, the annual operating. So writers and musicians, because this program is um, open to any arts discipline, you can apply as a writer or as a musician. You can also apply if your art base is, or your art form is multidisciplinary. So, um, you know, if you're a songwriter, whatever the multidisciplinary intersection of that looks like. Um, so just keep that in mind as it's very flexible and open in terms of uh, arts discipline. So I hope that answers your question. Please let me know if uh, there's anything else you wanted to know. Other questions. Can you share the link to application and guidelines? So um, thank you for that question. Right now, the program has actually not been launched yet. We're still finalizing application and guidelines. So you can expect that at the end of this month. So right now we're really just getting feedback, asking questions. This is sort of a pre-launch um, to really just be transparent about where, where this program came from, where we're, we're at right now, and um, if anyone has any suggestions that they there's an opportunity to really kind of get your your voice heard so that's where we're at right now so please stay tuned for the end of the month for that okay um do you know who the program manager for this grant will be yes that would be me i apologize i forgot to mention that earlier um, i'll be the program manager for the program some grant applic applicants ask for artists to have proof of professional work over two to three years before they are eligible for grant grants. This is a barrier for new artists. Will this be an issue with the grants for black artists? No, you will not have to have proof of work for over uh, two to three years. Okay. Another question. As someone who's neurodivergent, I would appreciate if assessors were given enough time and appropriate compensation for applica applications submitted as audio or visual applications as they're more time consuming. Yes, so that's something we're considering is with these various formats, um, it will, you know, may require uh, more time. So thank you for your, your feedback and uh, yeah, appreciate that. That's a very important point. Right. Can a collective apply for this funding if they have applied to other strategic grants, such as Open Door? Yes. So the funding parameters, um, there are, are less restrictions around this particular um, grant 
or of program. And the reason for that is because we understand that um, Black applicants are already facing sort of a lot of barriers to receiving funding. So it's a little bit more op open, um, let's say, than your traditional project or operating. So you can, if you've applied to Open Door, you can still apply to this program. The only, the only exception is you can't apply to a Black arts program twice in the year. Um, and you can only receive uh, another grant, one other grant in, in str the strategic category. Um, so if you have an open door, you, you won't, wouldn't be able to apply in that, the strategic grants category again, but you can still apply for Black Arts program. Okay, uh, another question. Can you apply to TAC programs as well if application is made to this program? Yes, yeah, so I think I already, I may have already answered that. Let me know uh, if there's a follow up to that. Um, okay, so someone is saying, um, I'm asking on behalf of one of the incredible deaf artists on this call. We are both Ontario-based residents. However, um, I'm just excluding names because it's being recorded for privacy sake. Um, however, one of us is a Toronto resident. Is it better for her to apply for our project? Applying as a collective, most of the collective would, would need to be uh, Toronto-based. Uh, the whole collective doesn't have to be, but I'm actually going to, for, for, a more, for a more specific answer, I'm going to defer this to our granting director, Andrew Suri, who's also on this call. Um, so Andrew, if you could answer this question, that would be great. Okay, how early will the first round of funding be distributed? If it's a rolling application process, how early might the first application be processed? That's a great question. So. We're looking at um, potentially having, I mean, there hasn't been a date set, um, but it would look like around fall would be um, when we start to to sort of prepare to process applications. And from then it's about three to four months out is what you're looking at. Okay. Guys, do you want me to answer that question now? Yeah, if you could, that'd be great. Yeah, so for collectives applying, as long as 50% or more of the collective members are Toronto residents, you're, you're clear to apply to the Toronto Arts Council. Thank you. Okay, another question. Do I understand that the grant amount is 15K, including a mentorship component, and 20K, including um, presentation and dissemination of work component. Um, so the highest total amount is 20k. For the presentation component, yes, that's true. Creation and development, um, the highest is 15,000. Um, and the highest total for presentation is 20,000. So that's correct. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will receive the requested amount. It's just that that's the maximum that you could receive. Uh, someone else says, have you considered working with Launchpad to purchase, purchase sorry, <laughs> memberships for Black artists for the collab? Um, for example, 50 Black artists can get access to the space for a year and TAC can run free workshops. Um, Launchpad has come up a couple of times. Um, I, To be honest, I, there hasn't been a serious consideration of this membership idea, but I love that you're bringing that up. Thank you so much. This is what this session is all about for, you know, feedback, suggestions, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, if maybe uh, we could save this comment and, and kind of consider it for when we're looking at developing those partnerships. I appreciate that suggestion. Will this recording be available online? Do we have permission to share this recording with others? Yes, you do. And it will be available online. We'll be uploading it to our YouTube and sharing um, through social media. So you'll be able to share with others. Might have missed this, but how much will the funding be for operating funds? So we haven't determined uh, exactly what uh, it'll look like in terms of how much will be allocated to operating and how much will be allocated to projects. Um, so stay tuned for that. That's something we're still finalizing within the guidelines. But the total granting amount is 500,000, um, which I mentioned early in this presentation. 
Will you be hosting any public info sessions, grant writing workshops specific to this granting program this year? Yes, so we'll definitely be having um, public info sessions. Uh, this is less of an info session and more of a uh, here's where we're, what we're doing session. And we will have info sessions, however, once the program is launched, where we can share uh, you know, how to apply, we can you know, give grant writing tips. Uh, we don't we have we haven't done so far um we we're not planning on right now doing grant writing workshops but that's something we're we're definitely thinking about um potentially doing like grant writing clinics or workshops um but just to let you know there hasn't been anything specifically planned at this time but if you would like to request a grant writing workshop or an info session that's available to you uh that you can request that and um we'll try to accommodate that um, as best as possible. So you can get in touch with me. You'll I'll share my information at the end of this meeting and you can definitely request that. Okay, I see that there are some comments in or questions in the comment section as well. So I'm just checking to make sure I haven't missed anything. Um, so applicants that are new to the program can also apply to existing programs such as, you know, music creation, audio recording, the writer's program, and for different project activities. Uh, so my colleague just reminded me to say that. <laughs> so yes, that, that is true. Can organizations that do arts work but have a broader social service mandate apply for arts programming? So that's a really good question. And this is something that there was some back and forth about um, in terms of who can apply. We decided that, you know, if providing arts services is part of their mandate, but they also have, let's say, other social service programming, that's fine. But if they are uh, a social service organization first, and that's their, their main reason, uh, and then they would not qualify. And, and that's just because we acknowledge that there are enough Black arts organizations that need funding, um, you know, that that we can kind of reach out to. Um, some uh, another thing to keep in mind, though, is that uh, collective. If someone wants to do some work and they they want to partner with a uh, service organization, they could potentially apply as a collective and and partner. So it doesn't it doesn't prevent them from partnering or working in someone's space and that kind of thing. Um, but they, the organization wouldn't be able to apply directly for operating. Yes, and um, another reminder is that this is not stimulus funding. It is permanent ongoing uh, funding for that you'll be receiving through this or that will be available rather through this program. So if a project is developed in Toronto and has presentation opportunities in Toronto and a non-Toronto location, can we still apply? And what happens if we can't present in person in Toronto due to the pandemic, but other location can, can we still apply? So the, the project does have to occur in Toronto. Um, so unfortunately, a project like that wouldn't be eligible because it's not happening in Toronto. Um, but I mean, the, if you had an online iteration of it, it and that that's a different story. Um, but yeah, in terms of where you plan to to provide the programming um, or the arts based service, it would have to be in Toronto and primarily benefit Torontonians. Is there a sense of the basic criteria for first time operational grants? Currently, organizations need to have earned 70K or more in revenue in their last fiscal year. In prior years, applicants would need to have three successful grants. Can you share so far what unique ways Black orgs are being assessed? Um, so the organization so far, there's no uh, requirement for three successful grants. Um, we're still working out um, guidelines. They will be a lot more flexible and open than you know what you're what you're describing. Um, but that's still something that we're sort of finalizing right now is what that will look like. I don't know if you want to add anything, Andrew.
no, hi, this is Andrew here, Director of Granting. Definitely the intention is to reduce the application barriers uh, and remove the you know, minimum revenue limits where possible, um, re reduce the requirement for CADAC reporting for the first year. Um, yeah, so, but like Timaj mentioned, the, the final guidelines are still being finalized, but the intention is to make it a lot more accessible than the current operating program. Yeah, and also um, to add to that, one of the, the administrative barriers that we're acknowledging too is financial reporting. So organizations will not be required in their first year um, to have audited financial statements, but they can submit unaudited financial statements. So that's for the first year so that, you know, uh, if, for example, an organization has not had the opportunity to be able to do their auditing, then this program will give them some some time to be able to prepare that for potentially the second year application. So that's another way that we're addressing some of those barriers. So another question, if an applicant is unsuccessful early in the year, can they reapply with the same project later on? So that's another thing we haven't quite finalized, um, but that's a great question. I don't have an answer right now, um, but, but that's something that we've, we've come across and that we're considering. If we receive approval for TAC funding in 2020, oh, that wasn't a typo, I just misunderstood. Yes, yeah, so if you received funding already, um, you would still be able to apply for this uh, once it's launched. Grants only fund projects or could they fund community-based programming too? Yeah, so the definition of a project, I didn't um, add everything that's in the guidelines on, on the slide because I thought it would be too much information, but um, that's a great question. And projects would include any arts based project, which is also inclusive of um, community based programming, as you mentioned, like a workshop series. And so you could potentially apply to develop the series uh, for creation and development. Um, or if you already have a series, you can apply to presentation to present the series uh, in community. If your project straddles two disciplines, specifically writing and illustration, how would you categorize it? Multidisciplinary or something else? Um, that would definitely be a multidisciplinary project. Uh, you wouldn't be asked to necessarily categorize it. You could just apply to the project program for, for whichever stream makes sense to you. Okay, so... Um, there's one more question. Uh, would there be an appeal process for unsuccessful applicants? Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, we're still building out some of those processes. There will also be an evaluation process built into the program. Uh, this program is uh, what I like to call a living program. So we're going to be constantly assessing how it's doing and and you know make adjustments as needed because you know, the, the communities need, as the community's needs may change, um, so should this program. So we are uh, keeping this open as a sort of a living program. And I know Andrew is giving you a little bit more of a specific answer to that. My project is a multi-year project. Could I apply? Um, so you can apply for whatever part of the project you anticipate com completing within that year. So you wouldn't be able to apply for the full um, I guess to, to have your project occur each each year, but you could apply for, let's say, the, the 2022 component of your project. And because the creation and development um, projects grant is pretty open in terms of the stage of development and creation that we fund, then you could apply, let's say, for uh, the beginning stages, or you can apply for whatever part, whatever process or, or stage of your project that you're in. Um, so if you require some time in the first year to plan, for example, you can get funding for that um, and to fund the first year's activities, but you, we wouldn't be able to fund subsequent years. You would have to apply again for that year. I hope that makes sense. But you wouldn't be penalized for the fact that it's a multi-year project, if that's what you're asking. We would just we would just ask you to to state which part which stage of the project you'd like funded. Oh, 
Okay, will there be a frequently asked question section in the guideline that incorporates questions that were answered today? Yes, there will be. Um, definitely part of the intention of this is also to understand what people might be curious about so that'll definitely be uh, included and we generally have frequently asked questions for all of our programs as well okay um any other questions comments would anyone like to get on the mic and say anything we have about four minutes left so i'll just open the floor to anyone who'd like to share any last thoughts or have uh, a last question. Okay, a couple of people raised their hands. Hello? Hi. Hi, no, this is really great information. Um, thank you for giving us advance notice. It kind of helps us to prep and as well as with the timeline. Um, hopefully if the timelines Align, then at least we know we will get funding starting in the new year for the apply now. So this is great information. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you for being here. Sorry, was there someone else that wanted to share? Hi. Hi. Hello? Hi. Oh yeah, I just wanted to also say this is great. I'm so happy that um, Toronto Arts Council is making the effort to reach communities that are racially visible or identify as black. And that's really key to me that you're, you're making the effort to go into the community rather than just waiting for us to figure out if these grants are available because half the time, once we find out they're available, the deadlines pass. So I really appreciate that it's more of a community effort of building together and supporting the artist rather than what I consider most grants are so hidden for especially new artists and um, so I appreciate the effort that's being made to reach us halfway. So congrats to the developers and everyone who did the, the report. That's really key. Once you do a report, then you know where the gaps are. And so hopefully we can continue doing this and really eliminate all these barriers. Because, I mean, the money is really ours, to be honest. <laughs> we pay into it. We're taxpayers. The money is ours. So I, I'm, just tired. I'm just so happy that we're no longer banned from our own money. Well, thank you for for your sharing your thoughts, and it's definitely something you know with the the ability to be able to really communicate at every phase of this process was really important um, for the for those reasons. We don't want this program to be hidden. We want to be able to reach as many people as possible that may need this funding. So um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts on. If we're being mentored, can our mentor be located anywhere in the world? Currently, no. It would have to be a Toronto-based mentor. Um, the mentor will be compensated, so that's a, a big part of the reason, but also we wanted to make sure that we can uh, support Toronto-based artists to develop as well, because um, mentorship, you know, both the mentee and men mentor uh, may benefit from that type of a relationship, so we want to make sure to, that we are um, supporting and, and amplifying the work of, of Black artists here in Toronto. Will there be a peer sorry will this be a peer assessed grant process by only artists of black of the black community yes okay um hope i didn't miss it, miss any questions last call for anyone who has their hand up okay all right well that on that note, I'd like to thank you so much for attending this town hall session. I hope it's been informative. I hope it's gotten some of you inspired to want to apply to this once it's launched. Really appreciate all of your questions and feedback. We'll definitely consider the feedback as we are working on developing and finalizing this program. Please stay tuned for the end of July, where we will be launching this program or when we'll be launching this program and if you have any questions if you'd like to hop on a quick call and, and chat about any of this um, we can definitely set up some time to speak you can contact me i will be the program manager once this program is launched and i can be reached at tamaj at torontoartscouncil.org and my number's there as well so thank you thank you so much